Hey everybody, how's it going? This is Eric Marienthal, and over there is <laughs> Mindy Hayfair. Right there. Right there. Right there. No, oh. right there. <laughs> <laughs> what, are, what are you doing outside right there in my room? I'm just on your porch looking in. Perfect. Wow. I had no idea I had the San Francisco <laughs> Harbor <laughs> outside my door. <laughs> Hey, um, we are uh, coming to you because uh, we want to talk to uh, Mindy Aber this hour about um, everything she's been up to and the fact uh, she's going to be um, part of our uh, 2021 uh, Smooth Jazz Cruise Woo! on land. On right. land. On land. So, uh, yeah, it's going to be hard to drag the boat uh, out of the harbor and up <laughs> and, into land. But, um, yeah, obviously, for obvious reasons, we aren't able to sail in 2021. We are sailing in 2022 absolutely so uh but uh in 2021 in lieu of uh everything going on um we are doing our cruise in las vegas if you're not already aware of that um and so uh it's going to be held at the uh beautiful encore resort uh and if you've ever been to las it's vegas beautiful. you've been there right yeah yeah oh man if you've ever been there uh it is one of the great uh resort and hotels um casinos in Vegas. Uh, the dates are February 28th through um, March 5th, and we have assembled quite a lineup. Uh, George Benson, uh, Marcus, Marcus Miller, I have this right here. That's right. It's so extensive I can't memorize it. Uh, <laughs> George Benson, Marcus Miller, Jonathan Butler, uh, Lee Rittenauer, uh, Dave Grusin, uh, the aforementioned Mindy Hebert, uh Eric Darius, Lisa Fisher, uh, myself, Patrick Stewart, uh, Nikki Harris, DW3, uh, the great comic Alonzo Bowden, and uh, many mm -hmm. others. Yeah, I know, it's great. Uh, so you can go to smoothjazzcruise.com uh, smooth uh, for more information, backslash Vegas, if you want to go straight to it. Um, so speaking of going straight to it, I uh, do want to um, mention a few things about her, about her, right there, that girl, yeah, that girl. yeah. You. yeah. You. Um, <laughs> Mindy's a two-time Grammy nominee. She's recorded 13 solo records, uh, including the four that she did with Mindy Hebert and the Bone Shakers. Two of them made it to number one on the Billboard Jazz charts. Two made it to the top three in the Billboard Blues charts. And Mindy has not 10, not 11, 12 um, number one hits um, uh, singles to her credit. Uh, she was featured uh, as a featured soloist, uh, saxophonist on American Idol uh, for two years, and uh, that led to doing a tour with this band, uh, Aero somebody, Smith, Aero Smith, that's what it was, yeah, it's hard to remember, you know, it's an obscure band. My summer, My summer vacation, vacation with Aero Smith. Smith. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're definitely going to hear about that. Um, let's see, you own the uh, Reserve Tasting Wine Company. Uh, you wrote a book entitled How to Play Madison Square Garden, A Guide to Stage Performance. Um, you uh, have a, a, a dedicated website to uh, empowering women um, called Pretty Girl, Pretty Good for a Girl dot net. That, it's very, very cool. It features articles from you and Maya Angelou and um, Oprah and Amy Poehler and many more. Uh, you had your own syndicated, I'm getting tired just reading all this stuff. You had your own syndicated uh, radio show uh, for eight years called uh, Chill with Mindy Bear. And uh, last, not lastly, but uh, for 10 years you served on the board of the uh, Los Angeles chapter of the National Academy of Recording Arts and Science, um, four years as governor and two years as president. Besides that, you're just kind of sitting around, man. I don't you know. like being bored. I like delving into things, you know. I, I like doing stuff. <laughs> but the coolest thing I found out uh, by, you know, reading up on you is that for two years, two years, you were the drum major of your high school marching band, <laughs> junior, junior, senior years. That, Absolutely. That is like the accomplishment of all accomplishments. Is that true? I love I that that's the thing that, you know, that, that, that hits you. you. Uh, and that, <laughs> that is true. Is true. And I was a total band geek from the time I started playing saxophone. It was fourth grade, uh, and it was band class. My teacher, Ann Reynolds, was, you know, hey, here are a bunch of instruments. Pick one, and we'll learn to play them. And my father played saxophone. I figured he was that guy knocking his knees together and walking the bar and rocking and rolling, you know, with the saxophone. I wanted to play saxophone. So I, I took every band class, I took everything, and I was very happy that no one 
told me it was odd for a girl to play a saxophone until it was much too late. So right. yeah, I, I took it to its limit and I wanted to be the, the director and so I auditioned and you know, I was drum major for the last two years of high school and it was a blast. Right on, yeah. The band geeks unite. <laughs> well, I was in marching band, but you know, I wasn't even good enough to be, be the right guide. You know, in my rank, in my row, you know, to be the right guy was the guy that you, you know, looked over to, you know, to line up with. So you were, you right. know, you were in a straight line. But no. You may not have been the right guide, but I think they all wish they could play saxophone like you at this point. And they're probably yeah. calling you for concert tickets. I mean, right. up well, until this year. <laughs> yeah. Back in marching band, it didn't really matter. You know? <laughs> right. It definitely, didn't. definitely more quantity than quality, I'm afraid. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> cool. And then we, uh, you and I met at Oleg's music shop. Unless I mean, I was trying to think of if we had met before that, but years ago, uh, there was a shop here in LA. Yeah. Uh, that everybody took their horns to. And was he your main guy for your horns? or? Absolutely. I met him early on, and I, I forget who turned me on to him, but obviously I met you in his little shop. You know, the best of the best went to him and, and still go to him. Uh, but I mean, he was this mad scientist of horns. I remember he redid the neck to my old um, summer Mark VI and just kind of opened it up and, and brought this beauty to it. Did he do that kind of stuff for you too? Uh, yeah, definitely. He did my tenor neck. and, and uh, But yeah, he has, I mean, everything. He invented, you know, yeah. he's got his own line of horns and mouthpieces and ligatures and reeds and cases. Sack strap. Strap. Leg. Wow, man. <laughs> Shout out. Yeah, there shout out. <laughs> <laughs> so is there an Oleg up there where you are for the next 24 hours, I guess? I know, right? Uh, we're moving tomorrow. So uh, you know what? I didn't have a sax place up here. I travel so much that I, I kind of just float in between things. But my usual thing is I've got a Yamaha horn. Um, all my horns are Yamaha. And so I go into Buena Vista, which is uh, you know, down by Disneyland in right. California and Jeff Peterson's there at the Yamaha Atelier and he's he is a serious math scientist. He's the guru. Yeah, yeah, so I don't go in a lot, but I'll go in and you know, you kind of beat up the horn after a while. I'm I'm not standing in a corner like playing neatly. We're, you know, muscling it around out there. So um, yeah, he goes in and does what needs to be done and replaces little pads and adjusts things. So yeah. he's my guy. Wow, awesome. He's your guy too, isn't he? Uh, yeah, Jeff uh, Jeff and his protege, Mike Cleveland. Uh, yeah. Mike lives a little bit closer, but I go to Jeff because uh, Buena Park is not far from here at all. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, and it's always a learning experience. He's always inventing. You know, have you ever had your horn uh, cryogenically treated where they put it in the deep, deep, deep freezer? Have I've seen that played thing? them. And that is so crazy, like, you know, alien kind of stuff. <laughs> um, but, yeah, if you don't even understand what Eric is talking about, they put your horn, and it's metal, in this cryogenic treatment that it, it is supposed to do something crazy with the metal and make it react differently and resonate differently. Am I, am I getting this? Yeah. You're exactly right, yeah. So they have horns now that are cryogenically treated. Um, mine's just old school, normal, stock, Yamaha. But is yours cryogenically treated? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, my alto I bought when I you know, when I was in high school, you know, when uh, when I was in marching band, uh, you know, and I still have it. So, you know, I've had that for, That's you know, I was in high school. It was like eight nine years ago. So, you know, <laughs> I, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, I didn't want to mess with it. Uh, yeah, That's awesome. and then you and I did a, uh, a a saxophone quartet recording with Jamie Tate. We sure uh, did. And yeah, and that was amazing. It was it was kind of a jazz, you know, a jazz saxophone quartet, yeah. sort of neo, you know, Hip, classic kind of. Yeah. yeah. But you, I remember you came in and it was Sal Lozano playing Barry, I think, and Jeff Driscoll played tenor, I played soprano, and you played alto, and you came in and you killed it, and you fit in the section so well, and it just, Thank I remember I, I came across an email that I wrote you just to, just to say, man, you know, I mean, you, you really just... You, you were just such, it just showed your, you know, your high level of musicianship. That's not easy. It's not easy just to be, to fit into a section like that and not to, you know, play like you normally play, 
when you play, you know, records or whatever. That's, so that a, but that's such a nice compliment. Thank you for saying that, because I, I think that, you know, there are different ways that people kind of play saxophone or, or get into what we do. And some people play in a section all the time, you know, whether it's Tower of Power or whether it's a big band, um, you know, a setting like that. I don't do much of that anymore. Um, I did it so much in college, because um, at Berkeley College of Music, if you had a scholarship, and I had half scholarship, was amazing. They would kind of make you work it off and play people's arrangements and stuff. So you'd be in there a couple hours a day playing different arrangements. And so I got a lot of time being a section as a big band, and I would usually play lead alto. And I, I just got into all the great lead alto players, like Johnny Hodges. And, you know, I, I was so into that sound. But when I got into making a living, and, and be in my own band, it wasn't a section thing. And so, you know, now a lot of the section stuff on my records, it's me playing Barry, and it's me playing tenor, and it's me playing alto. <laughs> so it's always such like a gift to be able to do something with someone like you, you know, and be there and be a section and get into your skin and get into your brain and, and play alike. That's what we did with Summer Horns when we made the record, it was with uh, Gerald Albright and Dave Paz and Richard Elliott and myself. And it was just so fun to kind of let our personalities go for a second and blend and then go out and be ourselves. So it was it's special. Yeah, how cool. And when you were at Berkeley, uh, I know you, you went not only, you were the one who graduated. You actually graduated uh, magna cum laude. So, uh, laude. <laughs> So, I love you know. that you know that, yeah. but yeah, a lot of people left before they got their degree because, you know, they got taken up, you, everyone cool got taken up, you know, no, before no, they no. graduated, but no. I got the piece of paper and no one in my family had finished college ever, and wow. I felt like I really wanted to do it, and I'm glad I did. I, I thought it was an amazing thing. Who did you get picked up from? I actually um, came back to L.A. and uh, got the gig with Al Hurt, uh, the the, uh, the trumpet player. The trumpet player, yeah, from uh, New Orleans, and we actually. Uh, <laughs> what an amazing uh, trumpet player! Yeah, yeah, some wild stories, but uh, but yeah, he was he was an amazing, really amazing player, and uh, they came to L.A. to audition uh, the band, and I, I got in the band and, and moved to New Orleans for a year, and played You're it. Like his, goodbye. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we were. I think I we were making six hundred a week, which back then was like a lot of money, you know, awesome. for a touring band. So we, we lived in New Orleans and played at his club right in the middle of the French Quarter, for, uh, you know, and uh, Bourbon and St. Louis streets uh, during the week. And then every weekend almost we'd go travel to some new place, you know. So for a twenty-one year old, twenty-one year old, whatever it was, you know. Yeah, that yeah, was the best it could be. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And you, you studied with Joe. You studied with Joe Viola, right? Did you too? I did. Yeah. I know we've had this discussion. I'm just, I'm forgetting it all. But um, Joe was like, and you know this, Yoda of saxophone. And I was, I just feel so lucky that I got to study with him because he was that guy that was the art of the saxophone. He was like, you can learn all the licks and the solos from whoever. You can play rock, you can play jazz, but you learn the saxophone. Learn how to play the saxophone. Learn the tuning of the saxophone. Learn, you know, how to work it, and you'll be fine. You'll be fine. And what a great basis for going out into the world. And besides that, he was an incredible, just guy that pushed me to be me. Uh, because, you know, I would didn't play like a lot of people at Berkeley. I wasn't a, a technical uh, person, but I, I don't think like uh, a lot of bebop jazz players. <laughs> I, I came up with rock and roll and blues, and uh, I've got a simpler mind. You know, I wanted to play pop, I wanted to play uh, rock, I wanted melody, and he was just like, Mindy, start your own band. Every week I'd walk into his office, Mindy, start your own band, do it now become you, find what works for you, write your own stuff, have your band play it. And those were just immense, immense things to tell someone who was 18 years old, you know. 
Wow, absolutely. So you came back to LA, did you afterwards? And did you come yeah. back to LA or did you go to, where'd you go? I, I grew up in Florida, so I was like, I'm not going back to Florida. Um, I graduated and packed up everything I had. Um, actually, we had a chance to be moved out here, much like you, uh, like be picked off by a cool you know, artist. And they flew me out to LA uh, along with a bunch of other people. It was Ava Boreal Jr. on drums and uh, a bunch of cool you know, people from that class at Berkeley. And we were just graduating. Ava was a year behind me. But Barry Manilow needed a band. <laughs> and so we were the, the cats from Berkeley that they brought in to see, hey, you know, would you be cool with these, you know, kind of youngsters being your new band? I mean, Abe had a ponytail on the top of his head and like his head shaved. I had hair down to my butt and the sides shaved off. The percussionists looked like Tarzan. We were so not Barry Manilow's new band. <laughs> but it showed me LA and uh, I had never spent any time here. And the weather was like Florida and it was beautiful. and. You know, I knew Abe and his parents, and that was about it. But um, wow. I just packed up and moved. Wow. So it was great. We did not get the gig, but <laughs> I knew this was where I wanted to be. Yeah. <laughs> wow, how cool. Well, then, so when did uh, Bobby Lyle's whole thing come along? You, you, didn't you, you recorded with Bobby. I mean, how did he, how did he find you? So that that's a crazy story. So when I moved out here, I mean, you know this, there's enough musicians to go around and there's definitely enough saxophone players to go around. You lived here. They didn't need me. Okay. Here comes this girl from Berkeley. Like, yeah, hire me. Like, I'm sorry. We've got Richard Elliott down the street. We've got Eric Marienthal. We've got, you know, Dave cause, why do we need you? So I was sitting in the clubs. I was doing anything I could to make a living, uh, you know, and, I finally just said, I'm just, if they don't hire me, I'm gonna go just play. And I came here to play, I came here to sing, I came here to write. So I stood out on Third Street Promenade in Santa Monica and played. I put out my case, I had a little boom box, and I'd play like tracks that I found or that we made, and I just had fun, I played. and. Actually, Bobby Lyle walked up one day, and I was horrified, you know, because I just thought, oh my God, I'm trying to be a professional musician, and this guy is someone I, I idolize. I think Bobby Lyle's one of the greatest keyboard players to ever walk the planet. And uh, he stood and he watched, and when I stopped playing, he goes, I should hire you. I'm wow. recording a new record, and, and I'm gonna go out on tour. Maybe you'd be interested. And I, I was just like, yeah, <laughs> <You're> <laughs> yes, you playing on the street, come oh, on, like, <laughs> of course I'm interested. And I went on to play with him for five or six years on and off, and that really, that snowballed my career. I got to meet so many people, so many great guys in his band who were so respectful of me and just took me under their wing and uh, showed me the ropes and, you know. Uh, there's a child next door if you haven't uh, checked it out. <laughs> <laughs> this is the fun of being no out idea. on your back porch, you know? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's quite a porch you have. I can see, you can see San Francisco. You pointed you that can. out. Over your right shoulder, right? Right back there. Yeah. That's San Francisco. Very cool. Yeah. Awesome. So that was that around the time that you met? I was playing with Lee Rittenauer, and Tim Landers was in the band playing yes. bass. And then, and Tim was always talking about you, about Mindy Abe. Uh, and, he was and, great. You know, I mean, he not only was he a huge fan, but he's a record producer, and, yeah. and he wanted to. Um, so, how did that get started, and where did that lead? You know what? I met Tim because my uh, my friend from college, Tommy Coster Jr., he was my keyboard player in the band that I put right. together. Yeah. Uh, that Joe Viola was, you know, harping on me. So my keyboard player was Tommy Coster. And April Boreal Jr. was playing drums, and you know, so it was like I had my band, but I moved out to LA and I didn't have anyone. Mm -hmm. So 
I called Tommy, and he still lived in Boston, and I just said, please move here. Please, you have to move here. I don't know anyone. Like, if you move here, I could get us gigs. We could play coffee shops and at least eat. Uh, so I talked him into it. And he's like, I know a bass player, this guy that used to play with my dad, Tim Landers. So Tim Landers joined the band. And Tim started producing me. And the first songs I did were Tim Landers productions. And I just think he walks on water. He's amazing. Yeah. He's amazing. Absolutely. Yeah. And so did that lead to you working with John Tesh? Was, were you involved in that? Yeah, because, you know, here's the, the snowball of it all. Like, Tim was playing in John Tesh's band at the time. So my band had this gig at a place called Le Cafe that I think you've played many times. Uh, it doesn't exist anymore. But we played Le Cafe, and in walks John Tesh, who's got to be close to seven feet tall, blonde, sticks out in a crowd, let's just say. And uh, he walked in. I mean, the room probably seats 40 people, so he stuck out like a sore thumb. And I'm like, wow, huh, that's John Tesh. But he came up to me at the end, and he's, he was like, look, I need a sax player for tour. We're doing a record called Sax by the Fire, and you could be the sax by the fire. It's like, sign me up. So I played with John for a while, and uh, it was great. I got to go on tour with Tim Landers on bass and just amazing people, and it, you know, it was something that I hadn't done before. And I got to be front and center and, and be the lead on quite a lot of stuff. It was great for me. Yeah. Was Tim involved in your first record? No, actually, John wanted to sign me. John Tesh had a deal with Private Records, um, and he wanted to sign me to his label and have me tour with him, kind of as the, the, the whole deal. And I didn't want to do that. I wanted to make my own. I was a little headstrong at that point. So uh, I went on and, and said no to the deal. But unfortunately, that took me out of working with Tim for a while because I had to go make a living doing other stuff. So, uh, you know, unfortunately, no, I, Tim didn't produce on my first record. That was uh, Matthew Hager, who was my best friend in college. Right. So we did the production. Right. Killer. But Tim and I still keep in touch, and I just think he's amazing. Yeah. Well, yeah. So how did, uh, you know, more records went by? Um, Everybody I love that know. you know all this stuff, because we've now. known each other since then. I mean, this was like the be very beginning of my career, like stuff that no one else knows. No one has ever asked me about Tim Landers or even John Tesh. I mean, I don't think many people even know I played with him. That's oh, man. awesome. I mean, he was, yeah, Tim was talking. I remember we were in the car going to some gig and, and you know, me and Barnaby Finch and Tim, yeah. you know. Yeah. And Lee were in the car going to the gig, and, and he was saying, oh, man, you know, do you know Bindi Aber? And Lee was saying, no, no, I don't. And, oh, man, you got to check her out. You got to check her out. And he, I'm, the, you know, I'm like, you know, hey, you know, I'm right here. I'm in the band, you know. <laughs> I, <laughs> like, I play sax. Hold on a minute. <laughs> yeah. Why do you need her? I've got to you have out. me. Yeah, well, you know, let's just say that, you know, my, uh, hopefully my job security was okay at that point. But, uh, you know. It's a good thing yeah. he hasn't heard you put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> so then, um, you know, so a while later, uh, tell us about American Idol. How did that come along? You know what? American Idol was a blast. I, you know, who gets the chance to do something like that? And I, I had had the, the total gift to be a solo artist for so long. You know, I, I dreamed of being a solo artist and getting to do my own music and getting to choose my band and go on the road with them. But it does put you in this bubble. And it puts you in this bubble of, I play music that I write that, that's easy for me or that uh, appeals to me that, or that comes to mind. Uh, when you go into someone else's band, as you very well know, you're playing stuff that doesn't come to your mind, that you didn't write. and their career is either pushed or pulled back by you. So American Idol was interesting for me that I got to be a part of other people's careers and play different music and kind of get out of my bubble. And I thought it was so fun. Um, Don was called me for it. 
and he's one of my favorite producers ever, ever, ever. I keep wanting to do a record with him. But he called me, and he was so nonchalant. He was like, Mindy, I want a rock and roll saxophone solo on old time rock and roll. And probably if you do the track, you'll be on the TV show. And about 26 million people watch the TV show every week. I think that would be pretty cool for your career. I was like, I'm in. <laughs> that's, that's crazy. So yeah, it, it, I, I did it. It was amazing. The, yeah, you weren't just in the uh, background like Dan and Sal and the guys in the, in the house band. You were up front no, no. and featured. So yeah. what was the process of you know, learning that music with these new artists? You know, I mean, old time rock and roll, you take a rock and sax solo and you're great. Uh, you know, it's like, okay, this is easy. But you want to make sure, you know, in the studio and stuff, especially Philip Phillips was the next year. And so he loves saxophone. He's a total Dave Matthews fan. So everything's got to have sax. And I just wanted to make sure I didn't step on him as a, as a soloist, you know, that I kind of weave in and out of stuff, but, mm -hmm. but give him that respect of, you are the artist, and this is your thing, and support him. And so it was really fun to kind of talk to these guys and get in their heads and, and be a part of their vision for who they were as an artist. Yeah, that's cool. Right, and everybody, it wasn't just a matter of just playing, but I'm sure people had their, you know, had their ideas as to exactly what they wanted to happen, but you also wanted to put your own flavor into your playing and all that. Speaking of playing, yeah. You got your horn right there. I know. I'm like, Whoa. come on. You what? Want to do some playing? I mean, yeah. What the heck? The kid next door won't mind. No. <laughs> yeah. Well, he may, but I don't. You know, this is shelter in place. We all, you know, just kind of share. Exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll play you a song. Um, you know what? It's summertime. I'm gonna play an old jazz stand. Just because it's me. There's no band, by the way. That doesn't work here on my porch. We don't have room for six feet away. Uh, there's no microphones. It's just you, me, and the computer. Um, so I'll play a little acapella of George Gershwin because it's it's warm out. If you haven't noticed, I'm getting a tan. <laughs> All right, so sit back, grab something to drink. It's five o'clock somewhere. <laughs> I'm going to take out my earplug, too. <laughs>
Yay! 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 I got neighbors. <laughs> you got an audience. I gotta put my little oh, earphone back, back in, back but, uh, back but uh, <laughs> I got neighbors uh, yeah. applauding, applauding me. I love that. that. Thanks, you guys. Know? I hope they realize that most people have to pay a lot of money to hear that. You know, if they're getting a free <laughs> Mindy Bear show, man. <laughs> <laughs> I think they'll they'll come to all our concerts after uh, after they've heard me a bunch on the uh, on the porch over the months. <laughs> <laughs> We've exactly. been doing uh, Facebook, Facebook lives, lives every, every Tuesday, Tuesday. and uh, sometimes, uh, sometimes, sometimes it's, it's been, been in my living room because my piano's in my living room, so I gotta, you know, sit out there and play. But uh, but out here it's better, so we've done a bunch of them out here, and it's just so fun. Yeah. Aren't you just excited to get back into it? I mean, aren't you just like clamoring? It, you know, I miss it so much. I I miss the. I, I just miss the. Uh, connection you know there's something about being in a room with everyone and playing and it's this back and forth and it's it's just magical so I just miss that connection so much so hopefully uh, we do get back to it soon for now I'll play to you every Tuesday night on Facebook live <laughs> but yeah I just want to get back and see you play you with you and play for everyone out there it's you know it's, uh, well the, it's the next thing you have Unless I'm wrong, the next thing you have on your books is the Smooth Jazz Cruise live in Vegas, right? I mean, well, we have a Christmas tour. Ah. So we're going to see if that happens. I mean, it, you know, right well, your now first it could happen. Your first solo show. Yes. Your first mini Abear show. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah, and that's actually kind of your first, like, smooth jazz, you know, concert after the Bone Shakers, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's really interesting. Well, we've had a. We've had a few at the beginning of this year um, that we did, you know, before kind of Shelter in Place came about. Yeah. And then we went in the studio to do a solo record. And then, you know, it all went away. So it's like post Bone Shakers, um, it is interesting to, you know, kind of come back to myself and come back to smooth jazz and get to play the songs that I've loved for so long that I that I wrote early on, but then create new ones. This new record that we've been doing is, it, it's just, uh, it, it's so fun because they're songs that wouldn't work for the Bone Shakers. The Bone Shakers were, you know, grit and muscle and, you know, rock and roll and blues, but it's fun to come back to that melody and, and that part of me. So yeah, I totally look forward to, to being with you guys in Vegas. This is, yeah. So it, call it a coming out party. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> but you'll get to hear new music too. Yeah, the record's called Forever. Forever. Right. Yeah. And was this Mindy music that you've been forever? Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> um, is this music that you've been writing like even while the Bone Shakers was going on, or is it all post Bone Shakers? And... No, it was actually a bunch of songs that I I had been writing, but it wasn't right. You know, it's like you write songs and sometimes it's for no apparent reason. Songs just come to you and there's no necessary, you know, well, I'm writing this for this. Uh, you don't write music for something usually, in my world at least. So these songs came to me and I'm like, well, they're not right for Mindy A. Bear and the Bone Shakers and what we're doing now, but I'll kind of put them on a shelf and I'll be back to them. But there were enough of them. It's like, okay. This is cool. I got to make a solo record, and I got to come back to me and, and do these songs that are so meaningful. And uh, so, yeah, um, there were instrumentals. There's even one instrumental that we wrote a long time ago, uh, like early on in my career, and I always kept it, and I always loved this song, and like it never fit into a specific record well. And it's on this record. It's called April, and I'm I'm just. Is there some like blues bone shaker ish influence in this record, or is it really kind of just a complete um, 180? You know, throughout my career, it's like it's, it's been very pop driven, the production, or uh, you know, very uh, kind of soul and pop. Um, but those last few records for me that were on Concord in hi-fi stereo was really kind of earthier and, and driven by more of that, you know, kind of old school tube 
and amplifier and, you know, kind of those old sounds. Um, and then I went into Wild Heart, which was uh, uh, kind of this record that was the gateway drug <laughs> to the, the records with the bone shakers, you know. But that was a record, that record, that record made it to the top 200, the top 200 on Billboard. I mean, not jazz, I mean, just top 200 list. Uh, yeah. Chart, right? yeah. Yeah. It was, record. It, was, it went to number one on the cool jazz record. chart. Yeah, it did, which was, which was awesome. It felt so good because I had come off a couple of years of doing American Idol and touring with Aerosmith and touring with Max Weinberg um, and getting a chance to play with Springsteen for a night. I had all this kind of different energy in my life. And I had always played with these guys. I always on my off time from my career I would go off and play with my rocker friends. And I finally realized, why don't I bring them into my own career? Like, what's wrong with that? I would love for them to be on my record instead of I'm on their record or their tour or something. They don't fit into my world. I thought there's a way to kind of bring it all together and have me, every part of me, you know, just kind of supported on a record. So I brought these guys in to, to write and record with me. Um, Joe Perry from Aerosmith came in, played on a song, and Booker T. Jones, I'm such a huge fan of his, we wrote a couple songs and, and recorded one for the record. Um, Trombone Shorty opened up the record with me, and Max Weinberg played, Greg Allman, oh, the Greg Allman's house for three days and wrote this song with them and did a duet with them, and it was just, oh, I played it on piano for one of my Facebook lives a couple uh, nights ago, and it was like, you know. <laughs> but it was that record that really brought together a lot of pieces of me. And it was no synths, no kind of bells or whistles. It was real instruments. And, and it was kind of rootsy and, and more raw than I had done. Um, so the Bone Shakers took that a step further. But coming back to me for this new record, I wanted to keep it rootsy. Like, I love, you know, listening to the old stuff like Linda Ronstadt or Tom Petty or, you know, uh, it's just old, older music that's real, that's all real instruments in a room together. So that's what this record is. It's guitar, it's mandolin, it's bass, it's drums. Um, there's no synths, you know, it's B3 organ and piano, and real piano. and. Uh, it was fun to do. So it's rootsy sounding, but it's very melodic, and there's a bunch of, you know, songs that, that sound like, uh, you know, all of my records from the beginning of time. <laughs> right. Yeah. And it sounds like you did it in a way that, you know, you weren't compromised by any, any parameters from a producer, or you just did it exactly how you want to do it in terms of being live and, and yeah. real instruments. Oh, cool. Yeah. I, I really I produced it with my. Uh, friend and manager of many years, Bud Harner. Um, he was the guy who signed me to Verve Records, my first record deal. So, I mean, here's a guy that's seen me through everything. When he left Verve Records, he became my manager. So it's like I've just kept him in my family. Keep good people with you, right? Yeah, um, absolutely. So we produced it together. And so, yeah, I'm the record label, pretty good for a girl records. And. Um, <laughs> So I could do whatever I wanted. I brought in my friend from college that we were talking about earlier, Abel Boreal Jr., to play drums. And uh, my keyboard player for the last almost 20 years, Rodney Lee, did all the keys. Um, my drummer, Third Richardson, came in for a couple tracks. Um, and Tim Pierce played guitar, who's uh, you know, a total guitar guy. Um, and Sean Hurley played bass, uh, my bass player. Ben White came in and plays the bass. So it was really, it was pretty awesome. Very cool. Yeah. Okay, so you got to tell us, got to go back a little bit and uh, tell the whole Steven Tyler, Errol Smith story, <laughs> man. You know, you know, you can't let that one go. <laughs> no, I can't let that one. No. no, no. You know what? When I got on American Idol, the first song I did was um, Old Time Rock and Roll. And so I go out with the artist, we do the song. And finished the song, and I was walking off the stage. First person who says anything is Steven Tyler. And he goes, forget you. Who's your sax player? 
<laughs> so, so, so uh, uh, great. great. I love that. I love that. And I didn't see him a lot. I'd see him backstage and stuff when I did the show. But the very last show was the final. I get this call. I wasn't supposed to do it. I get this call from the producers, and they were like, you have to come down. You have to play. I'm like, oh. And I hang up the phone. I'm okay, well, I'm going to hop in the shower or whatever. Um, they call again. Bring all your saxes. We don't know what you're playing. Bring everything because I had played tenor and soprano and alto. I'm like, oh, okay, all right. So I hang up the phone. I'm like going in, trying to get stuff together. Phone rings again. I'm like, pick it up, Steven Tyler. Mindy, you got to get down here right now. I'm like, I know, they told me. No, no, you and I got to do something. Time's running out. We got to do this. We got to do that. I'm like, what are you talking about? So I go to his trailer. And he plays me the new Aerosmith record. Now, for many sax players, you know, if it was the new Coltrane record, people would be out of their minds, and I would be too. But if it's the new Aerosmith record, I'm a huge Aerosmith fan. Like, oh my God, I know every song from the last 40 years. And he's playing me the new record. Like, he's this close to my face, singing in my ear. And he's like, play over that. OK. So I just start playing over it, and, uh, and over goes, the record. Yeah, yeah over just the record. Go, like, whatever. Just play, play whatever, <laughs> play to it. <laughs> okay, okay, sure. Because uh, yeah, you know he had only heard me play on Idol. You know, Idol is not Aerosmith. Right. So then he goes, Waddy Wachtel tells me you sing, sing, <laughs> and he would sing something to me, and I'd sing it back to him. You know, he'd be just. Two feet, feet from my, from my face, face, Stephen Tyler, Tyler just screaming, you know, just crazy, crazy stuff. stuff. And I'd sing it back to him. He's like, you're hired. You have three gigs to prove yourself to the band. They don't know I'm hiring you. They don't really want a sax player. So you have three gigs. But we have a whole summer tour, and I feel good about it. You were going to be on for the whole tour. <laughs> I got no set list. I got no music to learn. He didn't even tell me. He didn't tell me anything. He told me he wanted me to sing too, but. Not what to sing, just sing. No, no. I went wow. in the first night, I'm like, do you want me to sing the upper part? Do you want me to sing the lower part? He's like. Whatever. See what happens. Did you know the tunes? I mean, did. I did. I got the set list five minutes before. That's the beauty of getting. Did you know the songs already? I mean. I did. Yeah, I mean, I'm an Aerosmith fan. It'd be like. You getting the, you know, the Chick Corea gig. You probably knew most of the Chick Corea tunes. Well, you guys came up with that stuff, so who knows? But if you got the Miles Davis gig, you'd know the music, right? <laughs> I might be able to take my way through a few. Yeah, yeah. So it, it worked out. Okay, now my computer's at 7% because I'm on my patio. Okay. You want to tell a joke or something, and I'm going to go get a cable? You want to get a cable? <laughs> I'll tell a joke, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, the little thing just popped up. Like, you have 7%. Oh, go for it. Yeah, I'll talk. Yeah. I'll, I'll read the rest of your bio. <laughs> yeah, no. no. Mindy was born. <laughs> I'll be back. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, this is a good opportunity to go back and talk a little bit about the cruise. This is, this is uh, the um, catalyst for this interview. Mindy's going to be on our cruise on land in Las Vegas. Uh, next year, 2021, uh, uh, we go from um, February 28th to March 5th, and uh, it is going to be uh, a pretty uh, amazing star-studded uh, event for sure. Uh, it's at the, M uh, the Encore Resort, uh, one of the great, great resorts in Las Vegas, uh, and um, our list of um, artists is amazing. We have George Benson. Uh, the cool thing is that this is going to be the first time for just about everybody that we're going to be able to perform. I should also mention the fact that, uh, you know, obvious, obviously, um, you know, current circumstances are very much uh, on everybody's minds. And uh, the Encore, um, I wouldn't know where to send you to see this, but the Encore has done an amazing job and, and filmed a, um, a tutorial, basically, on what they're doing in terms of social distancing 
and uh, just, uh, you know, pandemic preparedness. And, and uh, you know, we're all hoping that things are a bit better uh, getting into uh, February and March of next year. But even if not, I mean, they are kind of leading um, the way in terms of Vegas. Uh, uh, just, you know, we, we, um, everything's going to be done in one venue. And, um, and you're back. Did you tell a joke? <laughs> I didn't tell a joke. No, I'm talking about the cruise in Vegas. Okay. Okay. Yeah. No, I'm just mentioning, actually, made, finish that thought. It's all going to be performed in one theater, and it's a huge theater, but they're only selling enough tickets uh, so to allow for proper social distancing, and we're all going to be very much in our bubble there. And, yeah. you know, it's, it's really pretty uh, astounding um, in, in terms of what the Encore is doing in general and what we're doing uh, in particular for um, the uh, Smith Jazz Cruise in Vegas. But I just wanted to, you know, mention again the list of artists that I was about to mention is George Benson, um, Marcus Miller, Jonathan Butler, Lee Rittenauer, and Dave Grusin. Uh, Mindy Abair. I'm sold as of that. Uh, yeah, well, and then... Uh, that uh, guy. That, you, no, you, you. <laughs> there. It's hard to do that with a camera. Um, Eric Darius, uh, Lisa Fisher. You know Lisa, by the way? Oh, my God, Lisa... Has, has the most, the most amazing, amazing voice, voice I've, I've ever heard. heard. I mean, I've seen her do her own shows, and I thought she was great with Chris Bode or obviously the Stones, but oh my God, she blows my mind. I got to be on Lee Rittenauer's album years ago, and she was on the track. Um, oh my God. No, I, I'm going to be front row. Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> Fangirl. <laughs> Fangirl. Uh, and then uh, I'll be there, Patrick Stewart, um, Alonzo Bowden. Our, our favorite Love comic, Alonzo. The world's favorite comic, you know. Nick, uh, Nikki Harris, and DW, DW3, and a bunch more. So, uh, and that's, uh, you can go check it out, smoothjazzcruise.com, uh, and backslash Vegas if you want to go straight to that site. Okay, so, um, uh, so you were touring, uh, oh, well, well, uh, real quickly, I mean, what was the tour with Aerosmith like? I've got to imagine you weren't in the back of a van. <laughs> no. Something tells no, me. No, there were a million buses. Planes, uh, adoring fans. <laughs> and you know what? It was rock and roll, just wow. abandoned. Uh, Cheap Trick opened for Aerosmith for the whole tour. And I mean, that was the first concert I ever, you know, like paid to go to as a kid was Cheap Trick. And I'm way into Rick Nielsen and, and Robin Zander. And I mean, just, uh, I just, I was like on tilt the whole tour, um, but it was amazing. It was total rock and roll pandemonium. Everything you thought went on, went on. Wow. Um, I brought my girlfriend back one week, and she walked, you know, down the little hallway through the arena, and here comes Steven Tyler with almost no clothes on. I mean, no clothes on except these little silk kind of boxer shorts. A kind uh, of thong. Uh, <laughs> ah. <laughs> and he's like floating down the hall. Hey. And my girlfriend was just like. <laughs> so, you know what? It was just so fun. Uh, because they look at things differently. You know, it's, it's not a jazz band. It's not. Um, it, it's not about playing certain changes or soloing, you know, over the harmonic minor substitution for the 251. On, they're not thinking about that. It's a total, just visceral abandon. And what a, what a beautiful way to kind of live on stage for a few months, you know, that when you walk on stage, you're giving everything. You know, you're just giving your heart and soul and every part of you and you're sweating and you're just believing and going for it i loved every single second and i brought that back to my band afterwards i just thought i gotta give more i've gotta let it all out i've gotta give that pound of flesh every night that's the way to live for me i, I really loved that aspect of it right so needless to say after the first three gigs that you talked about and that was kind of the, you know, <laughs> trial, trial period. Um, yeah, yeah, it worked. I mean, the guys, you know, obviously the guys came up and, you know, gave you the thumbs up. I mean, everything was cool. The guys, the guys were, great, were great and they, they, they went, went for, for it. it. And, and, you know, I, I think, think that, that 
the beauty of a band like Aerosmith is that it's that total testosterone. You know, so the thought of bringing someone else into the mix, especially someone like me, maybe that would take away from that or take away from kind of the, the purity of that band and what it's been. They haven't been like the Stones and had background singers and saxophone players and, you know, percussionists and stuff like that. So I, I get it that they're guarded about bringing someone into their world, but I love that they brought me in and it was just a blast. And the guys couldn't be better. They were, they were really amazing. Wow. So now, um, uh, tell us about the Bone Shakers. Um, I mean, I know that you were touring and Randy Jacobs uh, yeah. was in your band. Um, I mean, and was he the, uh, he and Sweet Pea, I mean, were they the, uh, the catalyst of the Bone Shakers? Did he start it? I mean, how did that, how did that, how did the band start and then how did your association yeah. with them? So when I first moved to L.A., you know, back when you and I met, uh, I was just playing all these clubs. And this one band that I got to play with, um, it was Oliver Lieber's band, and it was R&B and rock, and wow. Randy Jacobs was the guitarist, along with Oliver Lieber. So I came in to play sax. And... Um, it was like the loudest band in show business. <laughs> I would go home and my ears would ring for a week. I mean, it was just like, but it was so fun. And I remember that first night I watched Randy Jacobs on stage. And you know Randy Jacobs. I'm watching Randy. He's on the front of the stage just playing this crazy guitar solo. Every, the whole crowd is just, the whole place is just going. We're at the Mint in the, Hollywood and this guy does a backflip into the audience Randy Jacobs backflips mid guitar solo and people went nuts uh, they were like letting him through the you know audience he's playing his way through I was like this guy and I are gonna be friends uh, he still does that by the way I know As you know He's in his 60s now, and he's just still like, ah, come actually, on. Yeah, he actually said last time, he said, you know, I'm not so sure how much more I should be doing like this. You know? He can't stop. <laughs> mm -mm. I hope he never stops. Um, I just love him. And he started the Bone Shakers. They were right out of Bonnie Raitt's band. And uh, I'm such a Bonnie fan that they were all playing with her. And I guess she came out and, like, named the band. Like, you guys, what are you doing out here shaking your bones? And so they wow. started the Bone Shakers. It was Sweet P. Atkinson, who just passed away. Yep. God rest his soul. I love that guy. And um, Rand Jacobs. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, they made five amazing records and just went out and toured. And, you know, just every place they played, they mowed the place down. It was, like, amazing. Um, but cut to many years later, Randy was playing in my band. And my band was playing in his band. So it was basically the same band. So we get hired for Newport Beach Hyatt Jazz Festival, and the Bone Shakers are on the other stage. So it's Cindy A. Bear on this stage, the Bone Shakers. So I went and sat in with them. That's what we do, right? And it was just electric. It was my band, but it was different. And just the fact that it was different music, and just a different feel. There was something electric to it. And I, I just looked at Randy afterwards and went, we should join forces. We should do this more. I want to feel like this every night. It was just so fun. So, you know, why don't we come up with music we both love for a few records? And we did. And uh, Sweet Pea was a part of it. And it was, it was just super cool. Derek Richardson on drums, Rodney Lee on on uh, keys and that. I mean it was just epic, 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 epic. So you know, you know it's amazing to stand on stage with your friends every night you know these guys I've played with for so many years um, but make music that you're so proud of. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Well um, it's almost uh, time to wrap up. Would you uh, grace us with uh, yeah. another song? Yeah. Catch your horn there still? I know. Ah. I got my horn. Oh, and we, before we mention, I don't want to forget about the fact that you've got, you are playing 
the Mindy A. Bear signature mouthpiece. Come on, baby. Hello. Look at that. Nice. You know what? It's fun, and you've got your own, got so your own. you get it. Like, get it. Like, you, you, you put your heart and soul into something. Like, I got, like, I got geeky with Theowani. Theowani is just another mad scientist of kind of physics and mouthpieces and horns. And I told him before Aerosmith, before I went on tour with Aerosmith, that I just wanted to create like a mouthpiece for the people. It would make it easier to play, that would make it more resonant. And for me, that would be something that was just so resonant and open, but yet had that nuance. So we worked on it for two, three years. Um, and then all my stuff got stolen. Um, and I called him and was like, hey, that little mouthpiece for the people, the, the universe says, it needs to be done now. <laughs> so we finished it, and I played it for a year before it went to market. It's been out on the market for probably three years. And I know wow. it's one of his best-selling mouthpieces. This thing kills. Kills. <laughs> so yeah, I'm very proud of it. It's fun to have sax players come up and say, "I play your mouthpiece." Like, that's right, you do. It <laughs> so what are you gonna do? Um. um I want, you know what? I want to do a song that's that's just kind of, um, I think, kind of resonant of the times. You know, we've all gone through this together, and I feel like we've been through the ups and downs of it all together. You know, the the, the kind of trying to deal with a pandemic and being with our families more and being home more, but then losing every gig you've got on the books. Uh, you know, so I, I think. There's a zen that we all hopefully have found with it, or will find. Um, but there's a song that I grew up with, Amazing Grace. So that always puts me in the, that zen place of, you know, we can deal with this. It's all right. Mm -hmm. So I'll play a little Amazing Grace. Right on. <laughs> And I gotta take the earpiece out. That's right. That's right. <laughs> it's like it's saxophone. Like saxophone. <laughs> hey, neighbor. Hey, neighbor. I wanna play Amazing Grace. <laughs> Thank you so much for being so generous with your time. It's so great to catch up and talk to you. Uh, good luck with your move tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's going to be me in a bunch of boxes and my big piano, <laughs> piano and a bunch of saxophones. <laughs> down to five. Down to Highway 5. Down to Hollywood. Yeah. Coming back to Hollywood, baby. Hollywood, baby. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to be seeing Mindy and uh, a whole bunch of other artists 
at the Smooth Jazz Cruise live in Vegas, uh, February 28th through March 5th. So check out the smoothjazzcruise.com for more information. Uh, Mindy, thank you very, very much. See you soon. Hey, thanks hey, for thanks doing for this. Doing this this is, so is so fun, and it's always, and it's fun, always to fun to talk to you. To you. Uh, uh, you know, we don't get to, don't get to talk, talk Dorothy Sachs, Sachs talk, talk enough. enough. So well, I will be know. front row on your on shows because well, I'm just a fan. I love you so much. Right, right back at you. Love you more. All right. Take care.